Good afternoon. Delighted to see you all here this afternoon uh, at the History Stage at the 2018 National Book Festival. Welcome. My name is Becky Brasington Clark. I'm the Director of Publishing at the Library of Congress. Before we welcome our next speaker, I'd like to ask you to take a moment uh, and spend it with the device in your pocket uh, or on your wrist, whether it's your phone or your watch or your camera, anything that makes noise, if you can just take a minute and ask it to be silent, that would be terrific for, for all of us here. Thank you. <clears throat> so you may not know that the manuscript division in the Library of Congress has the official papers of 23 U.S. presidents. The Andrew Jackson collection alone includes more than 26,000 items dating from 1767 to 1874, including 13 volumes of his military papers. Researchers and writers who delve into such primary source material often discover little known facts or new dimensions in historical events. These discoveries, whether shared in books, documentaries, podcasts, or movies, keep us connected to the history that continues to shape our nation today. History really comes alive in the works of talented storytellers like Brian Kilmeade. Fellow best-selling author John Meacham speaks of Kilmeade's gift for narrative and intuitive feel for great stories. Indeed, Brian's latest book, Andrew Jackson and the Miracle of New Orleans has received heaps of praise from a long list of literary luminaries. Jay Winnick describes it as a tour de force. Douglas Brinkley calls it a riveting introduction to one of the seminal battles in US history. And Brad Meltzer calls it a wild, page-turning history of one of America's most fascinating battles. But nothing speaks as powerfully to an author's success in telling a good story as do comments from readers like you. Of the more than 800 reviews I saw online for this book, most had five stars. One reader wrote, if more history were related in this matter, there would be more history buffs. Another said, it almost reads like an action novel. In fact, by the time I got to the battle, I couldn't put it down. Another said, this is a wonderful and fast read for history buffs with an interest in old hickory. And finally, this action story is a well-researched page turner, and it's true. Now, you're going to get a special treat today because Brian is going to take questions following his remarks. So if you'll please hold your questions to the end of his talk, that would be great. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to a passionate student of American history and a gifted storyteller, Brian Kilmeade. Just want to warn you, I talk fast. <laughs> hey, thanks so much for coming here. I know there's a lot of great attractions. I'm thrilled you guys decided to spend some quality time with me. Uh, we have some audiovisual portions of this presentation because I'm a TV guy with a radio show. I also like to tell stories to give you an idea of what's coming your direction. So before the book launches, uh, Fox News, Fox and Friends says, hey, Brian, put together a three-minute piece to give people an idea of what they're going to get, and I'll roll that for you. When I first started saying to myself, I love to do books, I did the games do count because I had a sports background. I was started as a sports guy. I thought, if you didn't go pro, did we all waste our time? If I didn't become Joe Montana, am I wasting my time when I could be doing other things? And it turns out most of us don't become professional athletes, so why do we do it? So I wanted to show people the games do count and talk to 73 people about what they didn't accomplish in sports, but what they tried to, but what paid off later down the line. Then I came out with it's how you play the game. So I wanted to weave in people of history from Teddy Roosevelt to Abraham Lincoln, what they did in sports, believe it or not, that paid off to what they became, even to Steve Young and great athletes like Evander Holyfield and people like you and I who didn't go pro, assuming there's no professional athletes, and to prove it doesn't matter, that life is what you experience, how you handle it. You might be set back, but you're never down unless you decide that is it. And what do you learn from failure or not getting success? To come, to come at it from another direction. Go at, it, go at it again and don't give up. After that, I was done. And then I started understanding the reason, when we were born in this country, we really hit lotto. We're not a perfect country, but man, we are pretty great. And even though we, don't, we do make mistakes, for the most part, we 
are on the path to getting better. We're willing to correct. And the reason why people misinterpret what we're doing in this country is because we have our fights in public. We let it out, but we all unify behind this principle of understanding that there's no country like America. And after reading great history books from Dave McCullough, like John Adams, and seeing him bring him to life, when he talks about John Adams coming into New York and is complaining that everybody's rude and in a rush, I go, wait a second, they still are. And I thought, wow, history and today, if I could bring some humanity to this story, I can't do what Dave McCullough does. I can't capture a famous person like Adams or John Meacham when he grabs Bush 41 or Andrew Jackson. I can't, I don't close that book and say, I could do better. I'm not that arrogant. I don't close Grant after reading Ron Chernow for book and say, wow, that was okay. I think it's great. So what I thought I'd like to do is point out things in America's past that shows you you or I are what make America. As much as we love the Founding Fathers, they live up to the hype. But the people behind the Founding Fathers made our country what it is. And that's why I came up and I looked at this for 20 years. I got it. George Washington's Secret Six, the spy ring that saved the American Revolution. And those aren't my words, that's what Washington said. To see a farmer, a bartender, a printer, which was like a journalist, a grocery store owner, and a socialite combined forces in three and a half years to bring down the British and, and infiltrate their headquarters and do it in a way that helps us win the Battle of Yorktown, allow the French to uh, land in America without being confronted by the British, while outing Benedict Arnold before he could turn over West Point. I thought they lived and died in anonymity. If I could highlight their struggle and what they did and the credit they didn't get, maybe I could tell a story that America could relate to. And so-called average everyday Americans turned on average everyday Americans because the fact is, without us, there is no America. As much as we love the men on Mount Rushmore, the people that made America are everybody else around Mount Rushmore. So George Washington's Secret Six opened up what I thought was a venue. Take the Founding Fathers, let the geniuses like Meacham and Brinkley and Chernow tell that story, but what if I bring out other elements? So I came up with Thomas Jefferson and the Tripoli Pirates. Now my problem with Jefferson is he accomplished so much, where do you focus? Every time since 9-11 they tell the story, they say, well, this isn't the first time we had a battle with uh, radical Islamists, and they refer back to Jefferson. It intrigued me, and the great people at the Jefferson Library and others were able to open up their books and show me how he took on four Muslim nations that were stealing our ships, capturing our sailors, and capturing the cargo, and demanding ransom in return. We wanted to take on this fight. The only problem was we had no army, we had no navy. So I came up with Thomas Jefferson and the Tripoli Pirates because the so-called pacifist presidents that did so much, from Secretary of State to Declaration of Independence author, never really talked much about how he took on this unpopular battle but in the end was praised by the Pope of his time and gave America international prestige. So here's a look right now of Thomas Jefferson and the Tripoli Pirates. In the aftermath of the Revolutionary War, America had won independence from the British, and that meant no more Royal Navy to keep its sailors safe at sea. The United States became vulnerable to a vicious new enemy whose extremist ideology we still face today, Islamic radical pirates. The year 1783, the United States were free but buried in war debt. They needed to build an economy from scratch using their greatest asset, trade. The most important passageway, the Mediterranean Sea. But danger lurked right off the North African coast. A new enemy would await, pirates from four Islamic nations, Morocco, Algiers, Tunis, Tripoli. Without a navy for protection, its merchants were helpless and vulnerable at sea. Pirates captured our ships, plundered our cargo, and turned the crew into their slaves, held for ransom that no new nation could afford to pay. Without trade, America's economy would surely collapse. Congress tasked two future presidents to come up with a deal, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson. They'd meet Tripoli's ambassador in London face to face. The ambassador was charming, but uncompromising, and demanded money for passage. 
According to the Koran, it was their God-given right. Both Adams and Jefferson left the meeting shaken. They didn't have a deal on the prisoners, and they didn't have a deal on safe passage for our merchant ships. Back in the United States, they waited for a recommendation, and that's where Adams and Jefferson split. Adams said, we can't fight him unless we want to fight him forever. For Jefferson, he says, you can't pay for peace. He sensed that the attacks would start and the price would only go up. In this case, Jefferson was 100% correct. The United States would cave to the pirates, borrowing money. It would cost them up to 20% of their national budget. Yet somehow, the attacks continued. When our first president took office, he would continue to make the payments, but he would also commission the building of six ships, including this very one, the USS Constitution. What were they like? Well, they had copper bottoms, they had solid oak sides, they were fast, they were strong, and they were built to fight. They wouldn't be ready for the Washington administration. Adams would choose not to use him during his years in office, but for Jefferson, he knew exactly what he was gonna do. He was gonna take on the Barbary nations. And the first one to declare war on us, Tripoli. Without congressional approval, all Thomas Jefferson's new Navy would be permitted to do would be to provide security for the merchant ships and blockade the Tripoli Harbor. The hope was to stop all commerce coming in and out and strangle the Tripoli economy, have a quick end to this confrontation. However, the blockade was ineffective. It was leaky. The Tripoli pirates knew how to get through. The Corsairs had the guile and the knowledge and the guts to take on the Navy. Therefore, a quick end to this clash would go by the boards. But that would all change with this captain, Edward Preble. The training would get intense, and the confrontation would begin. Preble's boys were brave and brash. They confronted the pirates, harassed their ships, and took them back. Even blew up an American ship, the USS Philadelphia, that the pirates once claimed as their prize. Soon, the Navy sealed the harbor. Day after day, their cannons would pound the coast. But Tripoli's leader refused to budge. The Navy needed a more powerful force, both on water and on land. Enter William Eaton and a handful of fearless U.S. Marines. They launched the land war, recruiting mercenaries, enlisting the deposed Tripoli ruler and his fighters to march 500 plus miles on foot. And after the trek, they took the port city of Derna in two and a half hours. Eaton's stunning success surprised even Jefferson, although ultimately his victories would be stymied by a surprising source, an American diplomat named Tobias Lear would cut a premature peace deal with Tripoli, stopping William Eaton from taking Benghazi and Tripoli itself. In the end, it would be another 10 years and another president before we ultimately won this war. But in the end, the message was sent. America was a naval power, would fight for liberty and assert itself as a world leader, a position we still hold today. So that was the battle with Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, and uh, Tripoli, which is Libya. And at the same time, we have our confrontation with Libya, the overthrow of Gaddafi, what's happened since. And we begin to hear terms like uh, Tripoli again and Benghazi again and the confrontation again. But if you look at Portugal, you look at Spain, you look at England, they had one thing in common. They wanted no part of this battle. But our country, just a couple of decades old, a couple of years old, was in a confrontation. We had to wait for a president. We had the Articles of Confederation. And once we had that president, he did not want to act. The next president says, we can't fight these guys because I've seen the look in their eye. They're going to fight forever. And they don't represent the Muslim people. These people, the Muslim people were oppressed by horrible leaders. They're great people. Our ambassadors love the people of these nations, but they hated the leaders because they were corrupt and oppressive. For William Eaton, you know Jefferson, you might know Edward Preble, but for William Eaton, here's a guy who's self-educated, put himself through college, became this warrior, and then kept pitching to, uh, to President Jefferson. Hey, Mr. President, I could go get a, a handful of Marines, I'll go get some mercenaries, and I'll take these countries. I know what makes them up. We'll take them out. Jefferson said, hey, calm it. Calm down. I got the ships. We'll be okay. Well, just a, uh, a sea war was not going to do it. Finally, he gets, he gets him about a 1,000 muskets, a little bit of money, sends him into Egypt. He gets a, 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 a land force together with uh, Presley O'Bannon, and they do something that all those other nations couldn't do. They took on the Muslim terrorists, and they overthrew him. And when they took Derna, you know what they said? Guys, I'm not your leader. Go do what you want. Open up shops. I'm not going to oppress you. But we pulled out early again, leaving those people back to the old leadership. And then it took Madison to go back because they started taking our guys again to settle everything up. And in case you think this is an American author thinking that America's great, let me tell you what Pope Pius said at the time. 
By the way, it's Pope Pius IV. I thought three Pope Piuses would have been enough, but they need to go back to Pius again. The Americans, with a small force and a short space of time, have done more for the cause of Christianity than the most powerful nations of Christendom have done for ages. So we acted. Next thing you know, we're in the War of 1812. But I thought also Jefferson, a deep thinker, an intellectual, who was asked to get a militia together for the Revolutionary War and said, I'm more of a thinker. He knew the rest of the world was watching. And Jefferson said this, weakness provokes insult and injury, a condition to punish, and it often prevents it. I think in our interest, it's our interest to punish the first insult because insult unpunished is the parent of many others. That is why he said we had to fight. Adams had a great argument. We didn't have much of a Navy. They weren't experienced. And guess what America did? Started off strong, got it wrong, rotated out our admirals, got the right guys in there, got better coordination, and sent a message. And I would argue, without that message, we don't have this much naval success in the War of 1812. So that book seems to resonate. And our hope is we'll be announcing a three-part series on the History Channel shortly. Keep your fingers crossed if you can, because I think it's an important story that has to be told. So then I thought, what would be great to talk about next? I don't know if anyone here has toured the White House. Have you guys toured it? Well, I had a chance to tour it, and they showed me the archway where they burned the White House to the ground, and the original flames are still there. It's right by the bowling alley. If you ever get a chance, check it out. Because they wanted America to remember how close it came to all coming to an end. When we had social studies class, uh, I could not get enough of the War of 1812. I could not understand why we didn't spend much more time on it. Well, it was a draw. They signed the peace treaty. They had this battle afterwards. You know, with some people said it was an unnecessary war. Well, the more I studied it, the more I realized how close we came to utter extinction and division. I mean, for the most part, the vote was overwhelming. But the northern states didn't want any part of this war. They said, hey, you know what, England? If you don't attack us, maybe we'll go back with you. We tired of the Jefferson embargo. I'm not really into taking you guys on. And we just want to get our economy growing. And most of the votes came from the South. So when the war started, we had very little of army. And we thought to ourselves, wait a second. Let's take on England. We think they're, uh, they're taking our sailors against our will. So if we're going to take them on, um, let's send our army up to Canada to fight them. Doesn't seem like a great idea. It wasn't. We left our whole, whole eastern uh, seaboard wide open. And what did the British do? terrorize. We're losing badly. Jackson put his hand up early and said, I got a militia. I want to fight. I want to get revenge. So please call on me. The Virginia base said, no, we got this handled. They didn't. Sooner or later, they had to call on Jackson. So this is the story that led to the battle that I think is one of the most biggest upsets in military history, certainly in American history. And can I just say, on a partisan basis, I'm glad we won. Here is Andrew Jackson and the miracle of New Orleans. The War of 1812, America's second war of independence, was going terribly for the United States. We were so weak, we've got just the worst generals, we've got no plan. The British, the world's premier economic and military power, thirsted for a second shot at destroying America after losing the Revolutionary War 23 years earlier. The most perilous and bleak time for the United States? The invasion and burning of Washington, including the White House. But here at the Hermitage, Major General Andrew Jackson was seething, and his country was losing this war badly. America needed a leader. Without a standing army, for President Madison, America's utter future hung in the balance. He found his leader in Jackson. His greatest challenge, stopping the British forces from taking New Orleans. If you lost New Orleans, and if the British controlled the great city, you lose the entire Mississippi River, and you lose all of our western frontier that we acquired through the purchase, so we wouldn't have been able to do westward expansion. The plan? Build a wall, dig a canal, fill it with water, and wait for a British charge. This berm, this protection, this wall was built in a matter of weeks, miles long to protect Andrew Jackson and the American troops. Over there were thousands of British troops. What they wanted? That was New Orleans. What's at stake? The future of the country. His mishmash of troops that comes in, part Choctaw Indians, Kentucky and Tennessee militia, Beals rifles and free men of color, they're not going to go out and engage the British. Jackson knows that would be suicide. 
Any expert would tell you Jackson's ragtag army would need a miracle to stop the British from spending Christmas on Bourbon Street, and Jackson knew just where to go to ask for it. Why would I be outside a convent when I'm trying to tell the Battle of New Orleans? Because this isn't just any convent. This is the home of the Ursuline nuns. It dates back hundreds of years. They prayed for Jackson's success. And among the people who think that these nuns brought him a miraculous victory, Major General Andrew Jackson himself. It's the miracle. It's praying for a miracle, the Catholic Church and the Battle of New Orleans. I mean, that is where we know that there was divine intervention. And that divine intervention would reveal itself in the final fight, January 8th, 1815. This becomes a bloodbath here. Uh, the corpses, when well, now we're just looking at green grass, it was the beginning of the end of Britain and in many ways the birth of modern America. Jackson's forceful leadership would help record one of the most decisive and stunning upset victories in military history. When Andrew Jackson left his estate before the War of 1812, he was known locally. When he was done winning the Battle of New Orleans, he became a national star, maybe the most famous person in America. But more importantly, his win sent a message to the rest of the world that we would fight relentlessly and furiously for freedom. As for Jackson, he would ride that fame to two terms in the White House and go down as one of the most consequential and influential Americans in our history. And that's this, the hardback that came out last year, Andrew Jackson, The Miracle of New Orleans. So if you think about it, the army that just beat Napoleon, Wellington's Invincibles, they get together and they say, let's just wipe out America. Let's stop America from uh, growing past the Mississippi River. We are going to stay and we're going to stop this growth. They saw us as a rival. They saw the potential that we could have and they thought they had it. Now, in case you thought that I'm overestimating that, Here's what the British Foreign Secretary said while they're trying to negotiate the Treaty of Ghent. I expect at this moment that most of the large seaport towns of America are laid to ashes. They were in possessions of New Orleans and have command of the Mississippi Valley, the Mississippi River and lakes, and that the Americans are now little better than prisoners in their own country. So what stopped that from happening? Andrew Jackson, this instinctive military leadership. He didn't come from the academies. The guy was brought up outside the so-called Virginia base or the Boston uh, power base. Either one of these. He was the first outsider to actually rise to prominence. And what did he go through? And I didn't realize this until I started researching it. What he went through was the ultimate and maybe the first rags to riches story. I mean, his parents come here from Scotland. His dad dies before he was born. His mom raises three kids by just basically being a housekeeper for other people, doing whatever she can to get through very tough times in the Tennessee slash South Carolina area. And then when it's time for the war, the older son, they knew one thing, they didn't like the British because they're Scottish. He, well, he goes to fight. He dies of heat stroke. So the two 13 and 14 years old, Robert and Andrew, start becoming couriers in the Revolutionary War. Well, they get caught, followed back to a house, and a British soldier says, clean my boots to both brothers. And they both say no. Up come the sword, down goes the sword, right to the brother's head, a direct hit. Andrew puts his hand up. He'd have the score the rest of his life, but he was able to parry the blow. They went to prison after walking 20 miles after they take their shoes off in the winter. They spent a couple of years there, but you know what stopped them? The mom was relentless to get him out. But by the time they got back to their house, they were so sick that Robert died, and it's just Andrew and his mom. So they need money. So she goes to a cousin to earn money. A trunk ends up on the doorstep of Andrew Jackson's house. It's his mom's stuff. He still lived and died without knowing how she died. He is alone at 14 years old. A war veteran, you could say. He was raised by his town. He was raised by his village. He was raised by his country. Therefore, he bled red, white, and blue. He became a self-taught lawyer, a judge, a congressman, a senator, a major general. And then when the War of 1812 happened, what is he thinking? Revenge. Put me in, coach. They didn't. You're a backwoodsman. You don't really know what you're doing. You didn't go to West Point. But he could lead. He couldn't get through. When all the other guys failed, he got through. And all he did was roll, uh, roll off battle win after battle win, but he knew they were gonna go for New Orleans. But he didn't have enough guys. 
So he had to get free men of color, Cajuns, make a deal with local pirates, had Tennessee riflemen, Kentucky riflemen. He put them together in three weeks. He got the whole town to dig a ditch. And if just in case he walked into New Orleans and felt as though they weren't all in, he let them know, if you don't fight with me, I'm burning this town to the ground. Turns out they were all in after that. Then he said, the British are gonna land here. What do I do? Stop here. What happens if, we don't, if they get through our first line? Dig another line. Told them there's no substitute for winning. They knew by the time this battle started, they couldn't miss. You know what they had better? They had better riflemen. They were more determined because the British were not fighting for their freedom. They were fighting to stop growth of a free nation, many of which wanted to stay and ended up staying here. So listen to these numbers. In under 45 minutes, we have 13 dead, they have 291. We have 5,300 fighters, they have 10,000. We have 39 wounded, they have 1,262. 484 are missing, which means essentially they were blown apart. We took out three generals, seven colonels, 75 officers. So why is it that Andrew Jackson was able to do what Napoleon couldn't? Because I believe on some level, America was meant for something special to the, be the beacon of freedom for the world. It doesn't mean we're perfect, but it means we're like no other, and it means we have a responsibility to do so. And for those who say the battle did not have to be fought because that's what they taught us in school, this is what Jackson said. If General Packingham, which by the way was the brother-in-law of Wellington, Wellington's like, yeah, I fought already. I'm not into going to America, but you're my brother-in-law, so why don't you take my army and go? And you could stay and be the governor. It'll be easy. It wasn't. General Packingham and his 10,000 matchless veterans, if they could have annihilated my little army, he would have captured New Orleans and sentried all the contiguous territory. Though technically the war was over, Great Britain would have immediately abrogated the Treaty of Ghent, would have ignored Jefferson's transaction with Napoleon. That means no Louisiana purchase. It means the country of our country wouldn't have doubled in size. It means our Washington was burned, our five foot three inch president was on his own, our records were scattered out throughout the country. We were over, we were finished, we were through. If not for this 14 year old who finally found a way to get out of prison thanks to a relentless mom who was determined to pay back his country and pay back the British. I did not know when I dove into this that I'd come out with this. I did not know I'd be talking about what I thought was one of the original American success story and the promise that our country has, that if you do whatever you can, if you believe in yourself and you're determined to be successful, you'll have the opportunity to pursue happiness slash success. That's what he was trying to say. And when he rose up through the ranks, he wasn't representing the rich, the famous, the powerful. He was representing the so-called average everyday Americans doing extraordinary things to keep our country alive. Was he perfect? No, I'm not debating his presidency. That's for John Meacham. He's really smart with better hair. <laughs> I wanted to grab the moment in which he emerged at 40 something years old as the most famous man in America. Now, when Donald Trump puts his picture in the Oval Office, he becomes a story. In the paperback that comes out in two months, I decided as my excerpt to not debate Andrew Jackson, what kind of president he was, and what he did. Because back then, when people now are, are revisiting our history and think we know more, and I think we're coming off as a very arrogant generation that looks back and says, how could they? No one defends slavery, no one ever will. No one defends uh, fighting the Civil War and saying, wow, the South was right, no one ever will. But understand, these people were, set, were monuments in their time, put up by people in their day for a reason. And when you look at Jackson, we're revisiting him. So I thought I'd revisit him with this. Lincoln, FDR, Teddy Roosevelt, Harry Truman, Ronald Reagan. One asked who they looked to most in times of trouble and to setting out an agenda. Those men looked at that man. Did they look at him because he was perfect? No. Did they look at him because he was a self-made American success story that defined leadership in its own way, knew how to consolidate power and get things done, and cared more about the everyday people than he did about political power and prestige. And once he left office, he had a lot of power afterwards. 
So when Harry Truman took office, he had a figurine of Jackson on his desk. Before World War II, FDR, in all his pain, locked in his braces and walked up the steps to go to the Hermitage before he put our nation again at war. When Ronald Reagan chose to give a speech after being elected, he did it in front of the Jackson statue. When Lincoln wanted to know how to keep our country together, he looked back at Jackson's papers because Jackson said to South Carolina, oh, you want to leave? You got about one week because if you decide to leave, I'm sending troops in to make sure you stay. He was going to keep the union together. Exactly like Lincoln did? No. But there was something to learn there. So I thought Teddy Roosevelt, too, when he had to do a biography, he chose Andrew Jackson. So I chose to take one passage of where uh, uh, Andrew Jackson emerged and a victory that people still can't make sense of. They still teach about it in war colleges. My next project, which I hope you're enthusiastic about, which I can't get enough of, and no one wants to hang out with me because I can't stop talking about it. Do you ever get that when you're in the middle of a book or in the middle of research? All you do is think and talk about that because I'm very, uh, very simple. I pretty much think on one track all the time. But I'm doing Sam Houston avenging the Alamo and the link to Sam Houston and Jackson to see Sam Houston fighting in the Creek War for Jackson, getting wounded, Jackson walking over to the sick bay and saying, I need more guys to finish them off. And he gets up and fights again, gets shot again. They send him back to Washington to heal. It's burned to the ground. They think he's going to die. He lives. Jackson would mentor him. So I thought it would be a perfect next step. And to see what Texas has done is fascinating. I always thought you had to be from Texas to study Texas, because they get kind of resentful for a New Yorker to do it. But I'm finding nothing but open arms, and I, I cannot wait to tell that story, and I hope you like it. What I try to do in my books, I don't try to impress you with a vocabulary. I don't try to get you caught up in the background and the smell uh, in the air. And some people don't like that. But what I try to do is tell a story that's accurate, but concise, that makes you want to study more. I don't think I can do the definitive biography even on myself but I think I could grab a slice of what made these men and women great and tell you the story because really the supporting cast uh, matters so much. We are the supporting cast. We're not on Mount Rushmore, but we matter. And that's what I try to do with the books and people have been kind enough to get them. And I just love telling the story. And I never thought history would be so under attack as it is today. So I never thought there'd be so much news about things in the past, but it's here. And I'm still gonna say America is not perfect, but man, we're special, and I will always believe that, and I believe all of us, even if we we're the biggest critic of this country, we hit lotto when we were born here. Every day we're allowed to thrive here, and we're all in the Super Bowl. So with that, I'd like you to come up to the microphone and tell me how I'm wrong, or <laughs> tell me what you like, or ask any questions about the book, and, or the radio show, or Fox in the morning, whatever you want. So unless you're a really shy group, which I understand you're not, because I can't even get in the elevator, because everyone's so loud and deliberate, but I appreciate it. Yes? I'm not shy. I think you gave a great speech, and I think it's very important that we recognize the humanity of people in uh, history, both the good and the bad, but I really need to push back on your view on the monuments that were erected to them. Most of those Civil War monuments were erected after, way after the Civil War, as a way of uh, putting blacks in their place and reminding them. <laughs> and reminding them of their history in a negative way. I'm not for getting rid of the monuments, but I am for putting history in context. Well, let's talk about this. Great point. And if you read Grant, it really comes home. Yes. Because Reconstruction is so underappreciated and underreported. As a white guy whose family wasn't even in America at the time, I'm horrified that a country this great could rationalize slavery, to be honest. I don't know what to say about it. And I think a lot of white people in America feel the exact same way. But I love, like, I interviewed Jim Brown, 80, I did a show with him for five years. I interviewed him uh, Tuesday, and he said, yeah, we came from slavery, but look how far we've come. And he says, when it comes to um, back then, no one left, uh, uh, ever justified slavery, 
But in 2018, he says, if a white person in Manhasset didn't pay for my school without telling me, I wouldn't have become the running back from Syracuse. He says, a lot of white people have died because slavery was so wrong and they wanted to fix it. So I'm not gonna put that. I cannot, Douglas Brinkley, I said, said it best. He said, if we could take the Confederate statues and put it separate from past presidents. For example, if you're a Confederate general and you fought to keep slavery intact, if I'm black and I looked at that every day, I'd have a problem with that. But if you look at Jefferson, Washington, Madison, Monroe, I believe, everyone except Adams, I think in our first to eight presidents, they had slaves. I can't rationalize that. I could say at 30 they were geniuses. But for them to make sense of that, I can't do it. But I think, and I don't know your name, I'm sorry. CQ Tillery. Hi. Hi. <laughs> That's the CQ Hillary. Uh, Tillery. But, Tillery. But I would say this. I would love, I thought the 60 Minutes special was great. Can we put a plaque next to the statue that says they also sadly had 26 slaves or rationalized slavery for somehow put that along with it. But I think to take down Jefferson and Washington and, and, uh, and Madison and Monroe and Jackson, I think to diminish them as great leaders, acknowledge the slaves or slavery was wrong, but to diminish them as great leaders, I think we're in danger of losing our history. And maybe you didn't hear me. That's exactly what I said. I right. said that it needs to be placed into context. And I think that along with some of those Civil War leaders and generals, we need to put up a statue to Harriet Tubman, the first woman, black or white, yeah. who led a regiment of soldiers into combat. Absolutely. We need to acknowledge that it was African slaves that shared the, um, the cure the, for smallpox. We would have lost the American Revolution had we not had the smallpox injections. Did not know that. Soldiers okay. were dying of that. But women and blacks and Mexicans have become of hidden figures in American history. And when we unveil those hidden figures along with the people I that we accept, then we have the whole picture of what makes America great and continues great. Thank to you. make it great. Thank you. I hate to follow that. That was beautiful, so thank you. I'm just concerned with um, Jackson's wife. Um, I don't know if she had been married prior, but there's a big scandal around yeah. her and their r romance. And I just wanted to know if you had done any research on that. Or Not heavily, but by the way, they have life-size things at the Hermitage of the wife. The wife was like 4'9". He was like 6'3". Yeah, she was Rachel. Yeah, Rachel. Yeah, yeah, Rachel. And uh, the way I understand it, he, she had an abusive marriage. Yes. She got out of it. The paperwork wasn't done perfectly. He got married, and they tried to pin that scandal on him. Yep. Like Sam Houston, for example, had a had a marriage that lasted two weeks. He couldn't shake that. They basically told him to resign as governor. So those are the good old days in terms of scandals. But that was it. It's more of a paperwork thing than the first husband. They tried to sully who they became. But you know what? When I see about hear about Ronald and Nancy Reagan, and you read about uh, th those two, Rachel and Andrew Jackson, it makes you, they're such a great marriage. These, had, these two had such great marriages. Uh, they really got their strength from each other, and I think the women are so underappreciated. Yeah, that's right. I guess that was my point, was that I think she went through a lot of strife. Because she had a heart of, attack, too. Right, because, because of her situation, and um, I just wanted to know if you had any information about her and her life. A couple of things. She did not want to go to the Washington, but went out to pick a dress for the inauguration, and basically had a heart attack right after. So he ends up going to Washington with, a, with his niece and nephew, and they were... Uh, they were his, uh, his confidants because uh, when he got to Washington, no one wanted him there. They didn't like him there. They thought he wasn't worthy of the office. John Quincy Adams wasn't even there when the, to transfer the power. He left early. When Jackson got there, no security. They wrecked the place like it was a frat house. So they had to protect Jackson from his own so-called friends, everyday people. So we know some of that. Some of the similarities with Trump and Jackson were true in that he was despised by Washington, D.C. He was despised by Virginia and Boston. So there are some similarities between the two in that respect. All right. Well, thank you for that information about the wife. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Rachel Donaldson. Any other questions? 
Yeah. Let me just go with this. This. Uh, want to go ahead and step up, sir, and then he'll come. Yeah, I want to know uh, what about the what was the existing diplomatic structure between the uh, great powers and the Barbary pirates? So why was Spain and Portugal? They were clearly paying them off, and you know, trade's been going through the Mediterranean for thousands right. of years. Uh, what really made the U.S. sparked it to uh, to go against the grain there? Here, here's a, first. It wasn't right away, as you know. In the beginning of 1789, we start having our first uh, our first clashes. Uh, 1783, excuse me, 1785. 1783, we start. 1785, it starts. 1789, we get a president to make a decision. We really had no ambassadors there. We started putting ambassadors. One of the ambassadors ended up being a guy that was captive for years. He actually went back and went what, what we had as an embassy. We tried rationalizing, but the whole meeting that I don't know if I characterize correctly, but I do in the book. So Jefferson's in France, Adams in England. Adams goes, I had a great conversation with the ambassador of uh, Tripoli. You got to come over here and you're, you're, the, you know, you're a better writer. Come on over. Let's just lock this deal up. By the time they lock it up, they realize they're charging three times what we're charged, what everybody else has been charged. Because they believe, like the rest of Europe, Europe, many people think this is the hands of Britain behind them to say, charge these guys to the hilt. They're not going to be able to pay. And let's start taking their ships, destroying their economy before they can get their feet underneath them. By the time Adams and Jefferson get into office, they do end up having ambassadors there. One was given two weeks to get out of town or you're going to be held prisoner, so he just left. One other thing that I'll add, when they start to declare war on you, and it was Tripoli that did it, they chopped down your flagpole. And when Tripoli went to do it, they couldn't get it down. After like two hours, the ceremony kind of ended, and they ended up bending it like the next day or two. But we tried to rationalize it. We tried to make payments. But we were late on everything. It made it extremely stressful with the ambassadors. Number three, when Jefferson took over, he said, all payments stop. Let's see what happens. And what happens is they declare war. Jefferson goes, now I got no choice. I got to go in with my ships. I'll blockade. If he basically baited them into declaring war on us because when the payments stopped. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yes, hello. Um, <clears throat> let's see, where, where, where to start, Mr. I only Chairman? have a couple of minutes. Okay. I, uh, I want to get to another question. Okay. Two minutes. Okay. So I get you one minute. Okay, so I just want to say real quick, no one is attacking history. Um, when, when we look back at things and we try to point out um, discrepancies and people that were there and did also did great things and were not included and remembered in the same way, that's not attacking history, okay? So that, that, uh, that's, that's the first statement. The second thing is for you to No, you could, no, line, you, no, no, just a second. Can I finish? No, no, yeah, no, just, you say we, okay. who, who you represent you. I, so I understand we, that. Okay. I understand that. And you represent you. Right. Okay. So when you say we are attacking history, who are you representing? Okay, just you, tell said, me you, you said that there is an arrogance now of people that are coming out and attacking history. Yes. Okay, and I'm saying that that's incorrect. Okay, tell me real quick. Tell me what you think. Okay, well, I, I, like I just said, for the, the woman that first came up to point out that the monuments that were created after the Civil War that were put up by white Southerners to okay. say to people... I'll, I'll cut right to it. What do you think should happen to Jeff? What do you think should happen to Mount Vernon? What do you think should happen to Monticello? Okay, excuse me. Those are, those are different things because... Okay, different. That's yes, the difference. There's different. a difference. So, so okay. Uh, and, and first of all, I didn't say Confederate monuments should all be torn down. I didn't say that. They, they, they could be in okay. museums. First of all, you had a war fought, the side lost, by the way. So what are you honoring, number one? Um, but, but aside from any of that... Um, my other thing is, you know, for, for you to draw lines, because and I appreciate your passion for history, I appreciate the books that you've written, um, the, the stories that you tell are very important, um, but for you to draw lines like you did in your videos, um, like you, you're mentioning Jefferson and the Tripoli Pirates, and you draw a direct line saying Muslim nations to ISIS now, th th that is outrageous, okay? Okay. Okay, the other thing is, in the, the second video as well, um, when you, you, you're mentioning how no, nobody can explain how the battle was won, and so the answer is divine intervention. Um, that, I, that's, you know, that's a little ahistorical also. Um, but okay, I, I, but, it's, your, it's your option. I want to get one more question in. Okay. All right, on that, I said, uh, just to be clear, 
the leaders of those Muslim nations yes. were oppressing their own people. And when our ambassadors came back and said, I love these people, William Eaton especially, mm -hmm. loved the Muslim people. Mm -hmm. He had Muslims as mercenaries come back and take Derna in two, uh, two and a half hours. Without them, they don't win. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir? You've written several books with Don Yeager. How does the collaborative process work between you two? Don deserves credit in that Don and I met in sports. And he said, let's do another sports book. And I go, Don, I can't. For 20 years, I've been studying this spy ring. And I showed all these pages, these yellow pages. So he goes back. He goes, can I take him? I go, there is no other copy. <laughs> so he takes him. He comes back. It was Thanksgiving, three and a half weeks. And he said, I, can, uh, I think we could do more. I go, Don, we can't do this unless we approach it like a news story. So we went out to um, Port Washington. We went out to Stony Brook. We went out to Penny Packer, who did the original biography in 1930, and put the spy ring together. We were able to capture that. And I was able to take a lot of this oral history, put all the experts in the same room in a Holiday Inn out in Suffolk County, and I catered it. I didn't get Subway. I went to a regular <laughs> deli. And I had all these historians. And I said, first off, who's 355? Everyone had a different theory. Second off, Robert Townsend. Did he ever meet Washington? Where did it happen? Could have been diagonally across from Sagamore Hill. But how do we know it? Can you point to anything? And they were able to go through all our things. So he's the one who pushed me to do it. But um, he's the one who's an organizer, economizer of words. I'll pump stuff out. He'll gut it. He'll give it to me. I'll gut it. And I don't know how people do it, but he did it in Tallahassee, and I stayed in New York. And we only saw each other three times a year. But the magic of back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, while he's doing Namath's biography, while he's doing uh, Walter Payton and all these other things. So he wanted out of sports a little bit. I'm out of sports, because at Fox, I can't do sports anymore. That's why they have Fox Sports. So it was kind of a thing. I never thought I could do it if Don didn't push me. And after that, then I really thought to myself, I could do it because if I just capture one element and try to dominate it for two years, and move forward. And I made sure that John Meacham and Douglas Brinkley and Jay Winnick, I go, guys, look at it, read it. If you're not comfortable with it, let me know. And they said to me, it works, it checks out, and they go, I'll go on the back of the book. So that's why I felt, I felt good about doing it. But I'm still in awe of everybody speaking in the other room and everything like that. What I just try to do is tell a story They hopefully will give other people an understanding of, of America. Thank you. Thank you very much.